Welcome to another OCD Recovery Instagram Live. Uh, first of all, thank you for all the birthday wishes yesterday. Uh, got a lot of messages relating to that, so thank you very much. And a lot of cards sent in, so I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about guilt and how guilt plays a part with OCD. Now, for myself, a large part of my journey was relating to false memory harm OCD from the past. That's what it was latched onto. For years, it was just latched onto the past completely and springing up these new thoughts out of nowhere. So I would be going along and then it'd say, what do you, you did something when you were 12, you did something when you were 13, uh, you, you, you did some kind of, you did something that's completely unacceptable that, uh, and, and it would look for that, it would specifically go for those kinds of things. And uh, it was always sort of around sort of harm to do with having hurt somebody, having tr maybe tried to kill somebody or whatever. And where it gets in there is it looks specifically in the past for something where you're uh, maybe, for example, you got in a fight and it will tell you when you hit them, oh, you meant to kill them with that punch. Or when you hit them, they, uh, they hit their, you, you meant to make them smack their head against the wall. Or it's gonna, it's gonna specifically, it's gonna specifically look for anything to get you on in relation to that stuff. So it's gonna look for any tiny bit of uncertainty from the past that you're not aware of, that you can't remember, and it's gonna go for that like a ton of bricks. Uh, and so it will specifically look for things around the ages of sexual development, 10 to 14 or younger, and look for that age. It will keep, it will keep moving the goalposts. So whether it's to do with a harm or an injury where you say, oh, I could let myself off if I was such and such age, it will say, well, what if you were older and older and older and older? And it will just keep moving the goalpost. Now, in relation to guilt, what happens there is we can be become very accepting on a lot of things in relation to our OCD. But then what it will tend to do is it will go, but not on this occasion, not from this situation. No way, you cannot be let off the hook in this situation because this was you who did this. You are guilty for this. You have committed that crime. That's what it's going to specifically go for. So I used to think, oh, I can accept me getting hurt or me getting the disease. But if I did it, God, I couldn't let myself off the hook for one second. I wouldn't be even allowed a second to breathe. That's why I got Oliver to do that video the other day talking about guilt in relation to his own journey, which I've been coaching him through and how he can see and see the difference in how he's changing his relationship with guilt because guilt was at the key, it was at the core. It will always tell you you're 100% guilty. It'll always tell you you should have done something different. It will always tell you that... Uh, it, it, it will always tell you that you did the worst thing or uh, you, you, it, it was just too far or you just shouldn't have done that. Or, and it's going to look for the things, that you, the things that are the least accepted by society. It's specifically going to pick that. And it's going to make it feel as real as it can possibly get. And that's what it does. And then it latches on the chronic guilt feeling, which makes it feel so real. So you think, oh my God, this is real. I have been stuck. I have got, uh, I have got, um, I have done something uh, that's terrible because otherwise I wouldn't have this feeling. So how, and then, and then you'll start looking back. How could I have done this? How could I have been so stupid to have done this? How could I not have even realized this for so long? And then it will keep morphing and morphing and moving around. And that's the nature of what it does. So you've got chronic guilt. You've got uh, that latches onto false memory real event and it just keeps moving the goalposts. Um, and then people will often come and say, yeah, but I have done this thing. But then it morphs the thing or it takes the thing out of context when you did it um, or how you felt about it. So it makes that whole situation, it, it just basically skews it to make it feel exactly how it wants it to feel. And it doesn't let you off the hook. You can confess, you can hand yourself into the police. People often come to me and say, oh, well, I've handed myself in with handcuffs into jail, and they've said, no, sorry, you can't come in, or whatever, thinking they'd get relief. All these things are confessing, confessing to their families, confessing to their friends over and over. This will not bring relief. And chronic guilt is a sensation that locks on, and it feels horrible, it feels not nice. We don't like that sensation. So when it comes in, we get frustrated with it there, we get scared of it being there, we get annoyed it's there. 
And it doesn't let off until it can see that there's a reason to say, okay, you know, you can breathe now. So it's, we work by showing, changing how the person views it. So in the coaching, we go into great detail and changing how they view it and show, showing them how other people could have done the same circuit things and how if they had a son or daughter who'd done it, they would still unconditionally love them, but they might not like the act. And we anchor in from all these points to get under it. Without that, it stays locked on. You commonly see people with OCD being stuck for 10, 20 years, going therapist to therapist, chronic guilt locked on that hasn't released. I was one of those. You have to get under it. Uh, Albert Ellis's unconditional self-acceptance does exactly that, but it takes time and practice to see it and believe it. You're not going to be able to grasp it straight away. It takes a while to really deeply feel that. Uh, it did for me to see that and to do exposures and things around seeing that I could actually cause harm and humans can. Humans have been in wars and battles since the beginning of time. And, you know, humans are designed to fight and be violent and so on. So it's not like we're not. But then it's all the extra responsibility. And it can come in on anything. Oh, you knew that when you touched this. Oh, you knew that when you did this. Oh, you knew that when you, you should have, shouldn't have acted in that way or whatever. So it's always going to specifically look all the time for that gap, that movement. And it can be in your head mentally. Oh, I shouldn't have even thought that. I shouldn't have even done that. And then it will intrude intrusiveness. And it will do that because it knows that it can get hold there because it can just leap in before you and it knows what you don't like. And can do it in the same in the dreams format because in the dreams, especially if someone's been drinking or so on, these dreams can feel very, very real and so triggering because they feel, God, I committed a harmful act in a dream that was so real, I should have done differently. And then they can't differentiate between reality and the dream. And so the unconditional self-acceptance comes in here too, specifically, uh, to really get in there, to, 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 to help us to see that even in the dreams, even in reality, even in any circumstance, that unconditional self-acceptance still shows that we are at peace with us we accept ourselves. We may dislike the act, but we don't write ourselves off. And that's so key because so often what happens is with OCD, we've got this very black and white rigid thinking where we're like, if we did X, Y or Z, we would be written off completely forever. And then that's how we tend to look at things. And that's what causes us so much trouble, that very rigid thinking, because it doesn't give any breathing space. It gives anxiety the upper hand because it knows it's only got to just shift over to the black, between black and white, to one side and go and just shift over to that 50-50, whichever side, whichever way with the rigid beliefs are and just shift over there and then bang and lock in there. And then that's where it goes. Whereas if you're in the grey where it's more flexible, you know, it can, it can try and lock on, but it hasn't got anywhere to lock because you're more accepting and you're more at peace with these things. So it's a very, very important point because false memory is going to make it so convincing that nothing... This is not OCD. This is real. You've done something real. You are the exception. You are different. And it's going to lock to that, okay? It's going to really lock to that. And it's going to say, this is different. They've got OCD. You haven't. Your group you're in, they've not got OCD. They've got OCD. You haven't. And it's going to do that. And it's going to lock in there and make you feel like you're the worst person. I used to go into OCD groups when I was struggling and I used to think they've all got OCD, but I've done something, I'm different. And it's always going to feel like that. And then absence of anxiety is not an indicator of wrongdoing either. So I used to think, well, I'm not anxious about it. I can just see I did it and I like it or well, whatever. And it will, it will do that. And it's going to lock on. It's going to create that sensation. So you need to be very, very, very aware of that in relation to all these things. Because without that insight, it can make things very tricky because... Not that you, you, you will not be able to differentiate between OCD, anxiety and, and something that's reality. You're not going to be able to do that. It's often a misconception that people make and then they spend a long time trying to chase between the two, trying to work out what's what. Uh, and that's not going to happen. You know, in all the, the, the decade I've been doing, I've been, been, been working with people with, with anxiety is they spend far too long, especially with obsessive compulsive disorder, they're spending far too long trying to chase and demonstrate to themselves over and over again that this is OCD and this isn't the reality. And that is a nightmare. You saw it in all the books in the past where they were talking about relabeling thoughts, which has an important point, which is important to see, ah, I get an understanding it's OCD. We need some understanding of that. But after that, it becomes a rumination cycle that the person is stuck in. And you will not get relief like that. You need to get used to not knowing and you need to get used to worst case scenarios. 
okay? And that is where we come, we come at to make peace because it's, yes, you're gonna have to learn to relabel things and, you're gonna, you're, and that's gonna naturally come along so you can create distance between anxiety thoughts, OCD thoughts. However, you are going to have to learn to make peace with worst case scenarios gradually so you build up because otherwise it will be like looking up at Mount Everest from the bottom when you can't even climb a flight of stairs. So you do have to build up with these things and work through them bit by bit. That's the same as a hierarchy in any sort of anxiety uh, this sort of exposure uh, setup. You will always be working through that. So you need to start small and build through those. But the most important thing to remember is whatever the thing is that you are scared of, whatever, the fear is always an illusion and it's always picking something that you cannot accept yourself for you or for in life or from someone else, unconditional self-life or other acceptance. It's always going to specifically look for that and it's going to grip onto that because it knows that is the thing that you can't release on at the moment. It knows it's the thing where once it's got a grip, there isn't too much flexibility at the moment. So I think that's really important to have a good think about uh, because otherwise you will go back and forth. No, I've got to prove it's not real. I've got to prove it isn't because I can't accept it. So I've got to prove it isn't. And I'll get relief because I've got relief like that in the past, but you won't get relief like that in the future. You might have got relief like that in the past, but you're not going to get relief now because it's the, the, it doesn't always follow that pattern. After a while, it doesn't grip like it doesn't release like it used to. So you have to get used to the, the things that we're talking about here in the OCD recovery journey for it to release trying to get reassurance, trying to prove it didn't happen, definitely won't work after a certain point. It might have at the beginning given you some little bits of breathing space, but it certainly won't in the long run. Um, am I going to go through? No, I will cover. There's a lot of questions here um, coming in, and I think Momin's answered quite a few of them, but um, I will cover them, the, the questions specifically in another Instagram live because I just wanted to cover this topic for a YouTube video, but I will do a question and answer format in the next day or so. All right, guys, I will see you then. Thanks.